Beloved by Toni Morrison, audio by YQ, Chapter Twenty Two. I am beloved, and she is mine. I see her take flowers away from leaves. She puts them in a round basket. The leaves are not for her. She fills the basket. She opens the grass. I would help her, but the clouds are in the way. How can I say things that are pictures? I am not separate from her. There is no place where I stop. Her face is my own, and I want to be there in the place where her face is, and to be looking at it too. A hot thing. All of it is now. It is always now. There will never be a time when I am not crouching and watching others who are crouching too. I am always crouching. The man on my face is dead. His face is not mine. His mouth smells sweet, but his eyes are locked. Some who eat nasty themselves, I do not eat. The men without skin bring us their morning water to drink. We have none. At night, I cannot see the dead man on my face. Daylight comes through the cracks, and I can see his locked eyes. I am not big. Small rats do not wait for us to sleep. Someone is thrashing, but there is no room to do it in. If we had more to drink, we could make tears. We cannot make sweat or morning water. So the men without skin bring us theirs one time. They bring us sweet rocks to suck. We are all trying to leave our bodies behind. The man on my face has done it. It is hard to make yourself die forever. You sleep short and then return. In the beginning we could vomit. Now we do not. Now we cannot. His teeth are pretty white points. Someone is trembling. I can feel it over here. He is fighting hard to leave this body, which is a small bird trembling. There is no room to tremble, so he is not able to die. My own dead man is pulled away from my face. I miss his pretty white points. We are not crouching now. We are standing, but my legs are like my dead man's eyes. I cannot fall because there is no room to. The men without skin are making loud noises. I am not dead. The bread is sea-colored. I am too hungry to eat it. The sun closes my eyes. Those able to die are in a pile. I cannot find my man, the one whose teeth I have loved. A hot thing, the little hill of dead people. A hot thing. The men without skin push them through with poles. The woman is there with the face I want, the face that is mine. They fall into the sea, which is the color of the bread. She has nothing in her ears. If I had the teeth of the man who died on my face, I would bite the circle around her neck, bite it away. I know she does not like it. Now there is room to crouch and to watch the crouching others. It is the crouching that is now always now inside. The woman with my face is in the sea, a hot thing. In the beginning, I could see her. I could not help her because the clouds were in the way. In the beginning, I could see her. The shining in her ears. She does not like the circle around her neck. I know this. I look hard at her, so she will know that the clouds are in the way. I am sure she saw me. I am looking at her. See me. She empties out her eyes. I am there in the place where her face is, and telling her the noisy clouds were in my way. She wants her earrings. She wants her round basket. I want her face, a hot thing. In the beginning, the women are away from the men, and the men are away from the women. Storms rock us and mix the men into the women, and the women into the men. That is when I begin to be on the back of the man. For a long time, I see only his neck and his wide shoulders above me. I am small. I love him because he has a song. When he turned around to die, I see the teeth he sang through. His singing was soft. His singing is of the place where a woman takes flowers away from their leaves and puts them in a round basket. Before the clouds, she is crouching near us. But I do not see her until he locks his eyes and dies on my face. We are that way. There is no breath coming from his mouth, and the place where breath should be is. Sweet smelling. The others do not know he is dead. I know his song is gone. Now I love his pretty little teeth instead. I cannot lose her again. 
my dead man was in the way like the noisy clouds. When he dies on my face, I can see hers is going to smile at me. She is going to. Her sharp earrings are gone. The men without skin are making loud noises. They push my own man through. They do not push the woman with my face through. She goes in. They do not push her. She goes in. The little hill is gone. She was going to smile at me. She was going to. A hot thing. They are not crouching now. We are. They are floating on the water. They break up the little hill and push it through. I cannot find my pretty teeth. I see the dark face that is going to smile at me. It is my dark face that is going to smile at me. The iron circle is around our neck. She does not have sharp earrings in her ears or a round basket. She goes in the water with my face. I am standing in the rain, falling. The others are taken. I am not taken. I am falling like the rain is. I watch him eat inside. I am crouching to keep from falling with the rain. I am going to be in pieces. He hurts where I sleep. He puts his finger there. I drop the food and break into pieces. She took my face away. There is no one to want me to say me my name. I wait on the bridge because she is under it. There is night and there is day. Again, again, night, day, night, day. I am waiting. No iron circle is around my neck. No boats go on this water. No man without skin. My dead man is not floating here. His teeth are down there, where the blue is and the grass. So is the face I want. The face that is going to smile at me. It is going to. In the day, diamonds are in the water where she is, and turtles. In the night, I hear chewing and swallowing and laughter. It belongs to me. She is the laugh. I am the laughter. I see her face, which is mine. It is the face that was going to smile at me in the place where we crouched. Now she is going to. Her face comes through the water. A hot thing. Her face is mine. She is not smiling. She is chewing and swallowing. I have to have my face. I go in. The grass opens. She opens it. I am in the water, and she is coming. There is no round basket, no iron circle around her neck. She goes up where the diamonds are. I follow her. We are in the diamonds, which are her earrings now. My face is coming. I have to have it. I am looking for the join. I am loving my face so much. My dark face is close to me. I want to join. She whispers to me. She whispers. I reach for her, chewing and swallowing. She touches me. She knows. I want to join. She chews and swallows me. I am gone. Now I am her face. My own face has left me. I see me swim away. A hot thing. I see the bottoms of my feet. I am alone. I want to be the two of us. I want the join. I come out of blue water. After the bottoms of my feet swim away from me, I come up. I need to find a place to be. The air is heavy. I am not dead. I am not. There is a house. There is what she whispered to me. I am where she told me. I am not dead. I sit. The sun closes my eyes. When I open, then I see the face I lost. Sethi's is the face that left me. Sethi sees me, sees her, and I see the smile. Her smiling face is the place for me. It is the face I lost. She is my face smiling at me, doing it at last. A hot thing. Now we can join. A hot thing. Beloved by Toni Morrison, audio by YQ, chapter twenty-three. I am beloved, and she is mine. Sethi is the one that picked flowers, yellow flowers, in the place before the crouching, took them away from their green leaves. They are on the quilt now, where we sleep. She was about to smile at me when the men without skin came and took us up into the sunlight with the dead and shoved them into the sea. Sethi went into the sea. She went there. They did not push her. She went there. She was getting ready to smile at me, and when she saw the dead people pushed into the sea, she went also and left me there with no face or hers. Sethi is the face I found and lost in the water under the bridge. When I went in, I saw her face coming to me, and it was my face too. I wanted to join. I tried to join, but she went up into the pieces of light at the top of the water. 
I lost her again, but I found the house she whispered to me, and there she was, smiling at last. It's good, but I cannot lose her again. All I want to know is why did she go in the water in the place where we crouched? Why did she do that when she was just about to smile at me? I wanted to join her in the sea, but I could not move. I wanted to help her when she was picking the flowers, but the clouds of gun smoke blinded me, and I lost her. Three times I lost her, once with the flowers because of the noisy clouds of smoke, once when she went into the sea instead of smiling at me, once under the bridge when I went in to join her and she came toward me but did not smile. She whispered to me, chewed me, and swam away. Now I have found her in this house. She smiles at me, and it is my own face smiling. I will not lose her again. She is mine. Tell me the truth. Didn't you come from the other side? Yes, I was on the other side. You came back because of me. Yes. You remember me. Yes, I remember you. You never forgot me. Your face is mine. Do you forgive me? Will you stay? You safe here now? Where are the men without skin? Out there, way off. Can they get in here? No, they tried that once, but I stopped them. They won't ever come back. One of them was in the house I was in. He hurt me. They can't hurt us no more. Where are your earrings? They took them from me. The men without skin took them. Yes, I was going to help you, but the clouds got in the way. There are no clouds here. If they put an iron circle around your neck, I will bite it away. Beloved, I will make you a round basket. You're back. You're back. Will we smile at me? Can't you see I'm smiling? I love your face. We played by the creek. I was there in the water. In the quiet time, we played. The clouds were noisy and in the way. When I needed you, you came to be with me. I needed her face to smile. I could only hear breathing. The breathing is gone. Only the teeth are left. She said you wouldn't hurt me. She hurt me. I will protect you. I want her face. Don't love her too much. I am loving her too much. Watch out for her. She can give you dreams. She chews and swallows. Don't fall asleep when she braids your hair. She is the laugh. I am the laughter. I watch the house. I watch the yard. She left me. Daddy is coming for us. A hot thing, beloved. You are my sister. You are my daughter. You are my face. You are me. I have found you again. You have come back to me. You are my beloved. You are mine. You are mine. You are mine. I have your milk. I have your smile. I'll take care of you. You are my face. I am you. Why did you leave me? Who am you? I will never leave you again. Don't ever leave me again. You will never leave me again. You went in the water. I drank your blood. I brought your milk. You forgot to smile. I loved you. You hurt me. You came back to me. You left me. I waited for you. You are mine. You are mine. You are mine. Beloved by Toni Morrison, audio by YQ, Chapter Twenty Four. It was a tiny church, no bigger than a rich man's parlor. The pews had no backs, and since the congregation was also the choir, it didn't need a stall. Certain members had been assigned the construction of a platform to raise the preacher a few inches above his congregation, but it was a less than urgent task, since the major elevation, a white oak cross, had already taken place. Before it was the Church of the Holy Redeemer, it was a dry goods shop that had no use for side windows. Just front ones for display. These were papered over, while members considered whether to paint or curtain them. How to have privacy without losing the little light that might want to shine on them? In the summer, the doors were left open for ventilation. In winter, an iron stove in the aisle did what it could. At the front of the church was a sturdy porch where customers used to sit. And children laughed at the boy who got his head stuck between the railings. On a sunny and windless day in January, it was actually warmer out there than inside. If the iron stove was cold, the damp cellar was fairly warm. But there was no light lighting 
the palette or the wash basin, or the nail from which a man's clothes could be hung, and an oil lamp in a cellar was sad. So Paul D sat on the porch steps and got additional warmth from a bottle of liquor jammed in his coat pocket. Warmth and red eyes. He held his wrist between his knees, not to keep his hand still, but. Because he had nothing else to hold on to, his tobacco tin, blown open, spilled contents that floated freely and made him their play and prey. He couldn't figure out why it took so long. He may as well have jumped in the fire with Sixo, and they both could have had a good laugh. Surrender was bound to come anyway. Why not meet it with a laugh, shouting seven o? Why not? Why the delay? He had already seen his brother wave goodbye from the back of a tray, fried chicken in his pocket, tears in his eyes. Mother, father, didn't remember the one, never saw the other. He was the youngest of three half brothers, same mother, different fathers, sold to Goner and kept there, forbidden to leave the farm for twenty years. Once in Maryland. He met four families of slaves who had all been together for a hundred years: great grands, grands, mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, cousins, children, half white, part white, all black, mixed with Indian. He watched them with awe and envy, and each time he discovered large families of black people, and he made them identify over and over who each was, what relation, who in fact belonged to who. That there's my auntie. This here's her boy. Yonder is my pap's cousin. My mam was married twice. This my half sister, and these her two children. Now my wife. Nothing like that had ever been his. And growing up at Sweet Home, he didn't miss it. He had his brothers, two friends, baby sucks in the kitchen, a boss who showed them how to shoot and listened to what they had to say, a mistress who made their soap and never raised her voice. For twenty years, they had all lived in that cradle until baby left. Sethi came, and Howley took her. He made a family with her, and Sixo was hell bent to make one with the Thirty Mile Woman. When Paul D waved goodbye to his oldest brother, the boss was dead, the mistress nervous, and the cradle already split. Sixo said the doctor made Mrs. Garner sick. Said. He was giving her to drink what stallions got when they broke a leg, and no gunpowder could be spared. And had it not been for schoolteachers' new rules, he would have told her so. They laughed at him. Sixo had a knowing tale about everything, including Mr. Garner's stroke, which he said was a shot in his ear, put there by a jealous neighbor. Where's the blood? They asked him. There was no blood. Mr. Garner came home, bent over his mare's neck, sweating and blue eyed. Not a drop of blood. Sixo grunted, the only one of them not sorry to see him go. Later, however, he was mighty sorry. They all were. Why she call on him? Paul D asked. Why she needed the schoolteacher? She needs somebody can figure. Said Hallie. You can do figures, not like that. No man said Sixo. She need another white on the place. What for? What you think? What you think? Well, that's the way it was. Nobody counted on Garner dying. Nobody thought he could. How about that? Everything rested on Garner being alive. Without his life, each of theirs fell to pieces. Now in that slavery, or what is it? At the peak of his strength, taller than all men and stronger than most, they clipped him, Paul D. First his shotgun, then his thoughts. For schoolteacher didn't take advice from Negroes. The information they offered he called back talk and developed a variety of corrections, which he recorded in his notebook to re-educate them. He complained they ate too much, rested too much, talked too much, which was certainly true compared to him because schoolteacher ate little, spoke less, and rested not at all. Once he saw them playing a pitching game, and his look of deeply felt hurt was enough to make Paul D blink. He was as hard on his pupils as he was on them, except for the corrections. For years, Paul D believed schoolteacher broke into children that Garner had raised into men. 
and it was that that made them run off. Now plagued by the contents of his tobacco tin, he wondered how much difference there really was between before school teacher and after. Garner called and announced the man, but only on sweet home and by his leave. Was he naming what he saw or creating what he did not? That was the wonder of Sixo and even Halley. It was always clear to Paul D that those two were men, whether Garner said so or not. It troubled him that, concerning his own manhood, he could not satisfy himself on that point. Oh, he did manly things, but was that Garner's gift or his own will? What would he have been anyway before Sweet Home without Garner in Sixo's country or his mother's? Or God help him on the boat? Did a white man saying it make it so? Suppose Garner woke up one morning and changed his mind, took the word away. Would they have run them? And if he didn't, would the Pauls have stayed there all their lives? Why did the brothers need the one whole night to decide to discuss whether they would join Sixo and Halley? Because they had been isolated in a wonderful lie, dismissing Halley's and Baby Sug's life before Sweet Home as bad luck. Ignorant or amused by Sixo's dark stories, protected and convinced that they were special, never suspecting the problem of Alfred Georgia being so in love with the look of the world, putting up with anything and everything just to stay alive in a place where a moon he had no right to was nevertheless there, loving small and in secret. His little love was a tree, of course, but not like a brother, old, wide, and beckoning. In Alfred, Georgia, there was an aspen too young to call sapling, just a shoot no taller than his waist, the kind of thing a man would cut to whip his horse. Song murder in the aspen. He stayed alive to sing songs that murdered life, and watched an aspen that confirmed it. And never for a minute did he believe he could escape, until it rained. Afterward. After the Cherokee pointed and sent him running toward blossoms, he wanted simply to move, go, pick up one day, and be somewhere else the next. Resigned to life without aunts, cousins, children, even a woman, until Th Sethi, and then she moved him. Just when doubt, regret, and every single unasked question was packed away, long after he believed he had willed himself into being. At the very time and place he wanted to take root, he moved him from room to room like a rag doll, sitting on the porch of a dry goods church, a little bit drunk and nothing much to do. He could have these thoughts, slow what if thoughts that cut deep but struck nothing solid a man could hold on to. So he held his wrists, passing by that woman's life. Getting in it and letting it get in him had set him up for this fall. Wanting to live out his life with a whole woman was new, and losing the feeling of it made him want to cry and think deep thoughts that struck nothing solid. When he was drifting, thinking only about the next meal and night's sleep, when everything was packed tight in his chest, he had no sense of failure, of things not working out. Anything that worked at all worked out. Now he wondered what all went wrong, and starting with the plan everything had, it was a good plan too, worked out in detail with every possibility of error eliminated. Sixo, hitching up the horses, is speaking English again and tells Halley what his thirty-mile woman told him: that seven Negroes on her place were joining two others going north, that the two others had done it before and knew the way. That one of the two, a woman, would wait for them in the corn when it was high. One night and half of the next day, she would wait, and if they came, she would take them to the caravan, where the others would be hidden. That she would rattle, and that would be the sign. Sixo was going, his woman was going, and Halley was taking his whole family. The two paws say they need time to think about it. Time to wonder where they will end up, how they will live, what work, what will take them in. Should they try to go to Spalef, whose owner they remember lived in something called the Trace? It takes them one evening's conversation to decide. 
Now all they have to do is wait through the spring till the corn is as high as it ever got and the moon as fat. And plan. It is better to leave in the dark to get a better start, or go at daybreak to be able to see the way better. Sixo spits at the suggestion. Night gives them more time and the protection of color. He does not ask them if they are afraid. He manages some dry runs to the corn at night, bearing blankets and two knives near the creek. Will Sethi be able to swim the creek? They ask him. It will be dry, he says. When the corn is tall, there is no food to put by. But Sethi says she'll get a jug of cane syrup or molasses and some bread when it is near the time to go. She only wants to be sure the blankets are where they should be, for they will need them to tie her baby on her back and to cover them during the journey. There are no clothes other than what they wear, and of course no shoes. The knives will help them eat, but they bury a rope and a pot as well. A good plan. They watch and memorize the comings and goings of school teacher and his pupils. What is wanted when and where. How long it takes. Mrs. Garner, restless at night, is sunk in sleep all morning. Some days, the pupils and their teacher do lessons until breakfast. One day a week, they skip breakfast completely and travel ten miles to church, expecting a large dinner upon their return. School teacher writes in his notebook after supper. The pupils clean, mend, or sharpen tools. Sethi's work is the most uncertain because she is on call for Mrs. Garner any time, including nighttime when the pain or the weakness or the downright loneliness is too much for her. So, Sixo and the Paws will go after supper and wait in the creek for the thirty-mile woman. Hallie will bring Sethi and the three children before dawn. Before the sun, before the chickens and the milking cow need attention, so by the time smoke should be coming from the cooking stove, they will be in or near the creek with the others. That way, if Mrs. Garner needs Sethi in the night and calls her, Sethi will be there to answer. They only have to wait through the spring. But Sethi was pregnant in the spring, and by August is so heavy with the child she may not be able to keep up with the men. Who can carry the children, but not her? But neighbors discouraged by Garner, when he was alive, now feel free to visit Sweet Home and might appear in the right place at the wrong time. But said these children cannot play in the kitchen anymore, so she is dashing back and forth between house and quarters, fidgety and frustrated, trying to watch over them. They are too young for men's work, and the baby girl is nine months old. Without Mrs. Garner's help, her work increases as do school teachers' demands. But after the conversation about the shoat, Sixo is tied up with the stock at night, and locks are put on bins, pens, sheds, coops, the track room, and the barn door. There is no place to dart into or congregate. Sixo keeps a nail in his mouth now to help him undo the rope when he has to, but. Hallie is told to work his extra on Sweet Home and has no call to be anywhere other than where school teacher tells him. Only Sixo, who has been stealing away to see his woman, and Hallie, who has been hired away for years, know what lies outside Sweet Home and how to get there. It is a good plan. It can be done right under the watchful pupils and their teacher. But they had to alter it just a little. First, they change the leaving. They memorize the directions Hallie gives them. Sixo, needing time to untie himself, break open the door and not disturb the horses, will leave later, joining them at the creek with the thirty-mile woman. All four will go straight to the corn. Hallie, who also needs more time now because of Sethi, decides to bring her and the children at night, not wait till first light. They will go straight to the corn and not assemble at the creek. The corn stretches to their shoulders. It will never be higher. The moon is swelling. They can hardly harvest or chop or clear or pick or hull for listening for a rattle that is not bird or snake. Then one mid morning they hear it, or Hallie does, and begins to sing it to the others. 
Hush, hush! Somebody's calling my name. Hush, hush! Somebody's calling my name. Oh my lord! Oh my lord! What shall I do? On his dinner break, he leaves the field. He has to. He has to tell Sethi that he has heard the sign. For two successive nights, she has been with Mrs. Garner, and he can't chance it that she will not know that this night she cannot be. The Pauls see him go, from underneath Brother's shade, where they are chewing corn cake. They see him swinging along. The bread tastes good. They lick sweat from their lips to give it a saltier flavor. School teacher and his pupils are ready at the house eating dinner. Halley swings along. He is not singing now. Nobody knows what happened, except for the churn. That was the last anybody ever saw of Halley. What Paul D knew was that Halley disappeared, never told Sethi anything, and was next seen squatting in butter. Maybe when he got to the gate and asked to see Sethi, schoolteacher heard a tint of anxiety in his voice. The tint that would make him pick up his ever-ready shotgun. Maybe Halley made the mistake of saying "my wife" in some way that would put a light in schoolteacher's eye. Sethi says now that she heard shots but did not look out the window of Mrs. Garner's bedroom. But Halley was not killed or wounded that day because Paul D saw him later, after she had run off with no one's help, after Sixo laughed and his brother disappeared. Saw him greased and flat-eyed as a fish. Maybe schoolteacher shot after him, shot at his feet to remind him of the trespass. Maybe Halley got in the barn, hid there, and got locked in with the rest of schoolteacher's stock. Maybe anything. He disappeared, and everybody was on his own. Paul A goes back to moving timber after dinner. They are to meet at quarters for supper. He never shows up. Paul D leaves for the creek on time, believing, hoping Paul A has gone on ahead. Certain schoolteacher has learned something. Paul D gets to the creek and it is as dry as Sixo promised. He waits there with the thirty-mile woman for Sixo and Paul A. Only Sixo shows up, his wrists bleeding, his tongue licking his lips like a flame. You see Paul A? No. Halley? No. No sign of them. No sign. Nobody in quarters but the children. Sethi, her children sleep. She must be there still. I can't leave without Paul A. I can't help you. Should I go back and look for them? I can't help you. What you think? I think they go straight to the corn. Sixo turns then to the woman and they clutch each other and whisper. She is lit now with some glowing, some shining that comes from inside her. Before, when she knelt on creek pebbles with Paul D, she was nothing—a shape in the dark, breathing lightly. Sixo is about to crawl out to look for the knives he buried. He hears something. He hears nothing. Forget the knives. Now the three of them climb up the bank, and schoolteacher, his pupils, and four other white men move toward them with lamps. Sixo pushes the thirty-mile woman, and she runs further on in the creek bed. Paul D and Sixo run the other way toward the woods. Both are surrounded and tied. The air gets sweet then, perfumed by the things honeybees love. Tied like a mule, Paul D feels how dewy and inviting the grass is. He is thinking about that and where Paul A might be when Sixo turns and grabs the mouth of the nearest pointing rifle. He begins to sing. Two others shove Paul D and tie him to a tree. School teacher is saying, "Alive, alive! I want him alive." Sixo swings and cracks the ribs of one, but with a bound hand cannot get the weapon in position to use it in any other way. All the white men have to do is wait, for his song perhaps to end. Five guns are trained on him while they listen. Paul D cannot see them when they step away from lamplight. Finally, one of them hits Sixo in the head with his rifle. And when he comes to, a hickory fire is in front of him, and he is tied at the waist to a tree. Schoolteacher has changed his mind. This one will never be suitable. The song must have convinced him. The fire keeps failing, and the white men are put out with themselves at not being prepared for this emergency. They came to capture, not kill. 
What they can manage is only enough for cooking hominy. Dry faggots are scarce, and the grass is slick with dew. By the light of the hominy, fire sixo straightens. He is through with his song. He laughs. A rippling sound like Sethi's sons make when they tumble in hay or splash in rainwater. His feet are cooking. The cloth of his trousers smokes. He laughs. Something is funny. Paul D guesses what it is when Sixo interrupts his laughter to call out, "Seven O, Seven O, Smoky, Stubborn Fire." They shoot him to shut him up. Have to. Shackled, walking through the perfumed things honeybees love, Paul D hears the man talking and for the first time learns his worth. He has always none, or believed he did. His value as a hand, a laborer who could make profit on a farm, but now he discovers his worth, which is to say, he learns his price, the dollar value of his weight, his strength, his heart, his brain, his penis, and his future. As soon as the white men get to where they have tied their horses and mount them, they are calmer, talking among themselves about the difficulty they face, the problems. Voices remind schoolteacher about the spoiling these particular slaves have had at Garner's hands. There's laws against what he done, letting niggers hire out their own time to buy themselves. He even let 'em have guns. And you think he mated them niggers to get him some more? Hell no. He planned for them to marry. If that don't beat all, schoolteacher sighs and says, "Doesn't he know it? He had come to put the place all right." Now it faced greater ruin than what Garner left for it because of the loss of two niggers, at the least, and maybe three because he is not sure they will find the one called Pally. The sister-in-law is too weak to help out and Dagon if now there ain't a full-scale stampede on his hands. He would have to trade this here one for nine hundred dollars if he could get it, and set out to secure the breeding one. Her foal and the other one, if he found him, with the money from this here one, he could get two young ones, twelve or fifteen years old, and maybe with the breeding one, her three pickaninnies and whatever the foal might be, he and his nephews could have seven niggers, and Sweet Home would be worth the trouble it was causing him. Look to you like Lillian gonna make it. Touch and go, touch and go. You was married to her sister-in-law, wasn't you? I was. She frail too. A bit fever took her. Well, you don't need to stay no widower in these parts. My cogitation right now is sweet home. Can't say as I blame you. That's some spread. They put a three-spoke collar on him so he can't lie down, and they chain his ankles together. The number he heard with his ear is now in his head. Two, two. Two niggers lost. Paul D thinks his heart is jumping. They are going to look for Hallie, not Paulie. They must have found Paulie, and if a white man finds you, it means you are surely lost. Schoolteacher looks at him for a long time before he closes the door of the cabin. Carefully he looks. Paul D does not look back. It is sprinkling now, a teasing August rain that raises expectations it cannot fill. He thinks he should have sung along, loud, something loud and rolling, to go with Sixo's tune. But the words put him off. He didn't understand the words, although it shouldn't have mattered because he understood the sound. Hatred so loose it was jubba. The warm sprinkle comes and goes, comes and goes. He thinks he hears sobbing that seems to come from Mrs. Garner's window, but it could be anything, anyone. Even a she cat making her yearning known. Tired of holding his head up, he lets his chin rest on the collar and speculates on how he can hobble over to the grate, boil a little water, and throw in a handful of meal. That's what he is doing when Sethi comes in, ring wet and big bellied, saying she is going to cut. She has just come back from taking her children to the corn. The whites were not around. She couldn't find Hallie. Who was caught? Did Sixo get away? Paulie? He tells her what he knows. Sixo is dead. The thirty-mile woman ran, 
and he doesn't know what happened to Paul A or Hallie. Where could he be? She asks. Paul D shrugs because he can't shake his head. You saw Sixo die? You sure? I'm sure. Was he woke when it happened? Did he see it coming? He was woke, woke and laughing. Sixo laughed. You should have heard him, Sethi. Sethi's dress steams before the little fire over which he is boiling water. It is hard to move about with shackled ankles, and the neck jewelry embarrasses him. In his shame, he avoids her eyes, but when he doesn't, he sees only black in them, no whites. She says she is going, and he thinks she will never make it to the gate. But he doesn't dissuade her. He knows he will never see her again, and right then and there, his heart stopped. The pupils must have taken her to the barn for sport right after. And when she told Mrs. Garner, they took down the cowhide. Who in hell or on this earth would have thought that she would cut anyway? They must have believed, what with her belly and her back, that she wasn't going anywhere. He wasn't surprised to learn that they had tracked her down in Cincinnati because, when he thought about it now, her price was greater than his property that reproduced itself without cost. Remembering his own price, down to the cent that schoolteacher was able to get for him, he wondered what Sethi's would have been. What had Baby Sucks been? How much did Hallie owe? Still, besides his labor, what did Mrs. Garner get for Paul F? More than nine hundred dollars? How much more? Ten dollars? Twenty? Schoolteacher would know. He knew the worth of everything. It counted. For the real sorrow in his voice when he pronounced Sixo unsuitable, who could be fooled into buying a singing nigger with a gun, shouting seven o seven o because his thirty mile woman got away with his blossoming seed? What a laugh! So rippling and full of glee, it put out the fire, and it was Sixo's laughter that was on his mind, not the bit in his mouth. When they hitched him to the buckboard, then he saw Hallie. Then the rooster, smiling as if to say, "You ain't seen nothing yet. How could a rooster know about Alfred, Georgia?"